language in perception and thought. When we think about the way that color works in relation to language, we should think about three particular features. First of all, the Wolfian hypothesis told us that languages can dissect nature in ways that align with the words within their language, and they may be able to do this arbitrarily, or at least that's a question that we can ask. Is it possible for any language to name any part of color space in a way that's completely different from any other? Or are there some underlying constraints? Second, we can think about this question of how languages differ in the way that they name their colors, this idea of linguistic relativity. And then thirdly, does the labeling system that we work with, does it change something about the way that we perceive colors? Is it determining our color perception? To aid with our thinking, we're going to talk about colors using the Munsell color system. So in the Munsell color system, we have three different axes that can be used to define color. First of all, we have lightness, and this goes from white to black in one dimension. Second, we have saturation, which is how colorful is the color that we are looking at. When it's highly, highly saturated, it's as chromatic as that color can get. This is also sometimes known as chroma. And when it is desaturated, it's the lowest possible chroma value, which equates to gray. The third axis is a radial axis, so around the circle, which is defined as hue. So as we move around this circle from a yellowy color to a greeny color to a bluey color, purple, pink, red, orange, and all the way back around, the numeric system can be used to say how far around that perceptual space we are in terms of hue. So with this color terminology, if you're going to vary colors in a way and you want them to be systematic, you can vary them by equal steps in lightness, equal steps in saturation, or equal steps in hue. One thing we need to acknowledge though is that colors are not equally distributed through this color space in terms of human perception. So humans are better at detecting very fine gradations in difference for the high luminance yellow colors, but we're very poor at the low luminance yellow hues, which we would normally perceive as something in the brown department. We have a similar asymmetry on the opposite side, whereby we're quite good at detecting fine gradations of color in the blue department at low luminance, but quite poor at high luminance blues. So we have this asymmetric organization of color perception. If we were to take this color solid with all of those colors that we can and cannot see clearly and take the highest saturation color at each radial point, we can unroll it and we get something that looks like this. Now there are websites where you can look up a color and find out its definitions and you can look up those colors and get their hex codes. So if you want to build them into your experiments, you can. The other tool we sometimes use is a Munsell color chart like this. So in this color chart, we have lots of different standard Munsell colors that can all be described by a letter and a number. So if I were to ask someone, what's the very best example of say yellow, they might come back and say, ooh, C11 is the best yellow. So let's look first at this idea that languages might be arbitrary in the way that they carve up color space. In theoretical terms, it could be possible to cut this sphere in any direction you like into any number of segments. Since the 1960s though, it's been observed that languages tend to go only in certain patterns. So when Berlin and Kay did their 
large scale study of colour naming in different languages, they were aware that some languages have fewer names for colours than others. And in the most limited colour vocabulary, they might only have one colour word for dark and one colour word for light. According to Berlin and Kay, basic colour terms are those that don't use the name of an actual thing in the world plus colour. If you want to name dark red and you call it blood coloured, that doesn't count as a basic colour vocabulary. Uh, languages can sometimes have two colour labels, one for light, one for dark. If they get another colour label, it's usually this one, red. Following red, if they get one more colour label, it's going to be one of green and yellow, or perhaps a green yellow together. After that, one of those labels will break off and they will end up with a green and a yellow separate from each other. The next stage of colour vocabulary development is usually blue, followed by brown, and then purple, pink, orange and grey in some order. Now, if you're thinking about the languages that you speak, it can be quite interesting to think about whether your language has the kind of uh, basic colour terminology that Berlin and Kay thought was important. It's also quite complicated when we think about uh, languages like Japanese, which uh, has a very basic black and a white, a basic red, a basic green, a basic blue, a basic brown, but the word for yellow usually has ki iro, and that iro part of the word means colour, so yellow colour. Now it's yellow colour rather than the colour of, of something else in the world. The traditional words for brown uh, tend to be chairo, which is tea coloured. And then when we look at this tier of words, there's a traditional word for grey, hairo, which is ash coloured. There's a very old word for pink, which is murasaki. And murasaki is actually the name of the plant that is used to make a dye that can be pink, purple, brown, red, uh, maroon, orange, and uh, almost black. So murasaki is a very difficult color word, but contemporary Japanese, when especially for fashion colors or paint colors, uh, does actually use purple, pink, orange, grey, and brown. So in Berlin and Kay's terms, traditional Japanese probably only got down to blue in terms of basic color terms. It'll be interesting to see what you guys think about the other languages that you speak. In another set of studies with the Barinmo community in Papua New Guinea, Debbie Robertson has gone out and documented what are the words that people use for describing different colors and what are the best exemplars of the colors that they name. So when we look at these two different color maps, we can see that they're structured quite differently. English speakers have uh, their 11 basic color terms separated out into different areas across color space. And when we look at Barinmo, we can see one of these, uh, the two basic color terms for pale and dark followed by red, and then a green yellow color and a blue green color taking up the rest of the space. So it's a radically reduced color vocabulary compared to English. But when people are asked for their best exemplars, even though the words that are used to describe most of the colors are different, some of the best exemplars are the same, which means that although people have different range of reference for their colors, their best exemplars keep mapping to the same targets. So it's as though there is something neuropsychologically more powerful about some colors than others when it comes to perception. And those colors in perception become like the prototypes for different word meanings.
Kay then went on to work with other colleagues on the World Colour Survey, which was this Munsell chart I showed you before, but it was sent out to school teachers around the world, asking them to help uh, conduct a colour survey so that they could map how it is that different languages describe different colours and which are the tokens that people think are the best examples. So uh, this is English down the bottom. So each of these lines is uh, marking out another 100 hits in a particular area. So we can see yellow has a very highly concentrated response profile. Red has quite a highly concentrated response profile. And blue and green are a little bit more distributed. If we compare this for speakers of Barinmo, even though they're naming different uh, best exemplars of different color words, we can see a very similar pattern. So here we have languages that have a light, a dark, and a red. And we can see that superficially, just to the eye, they look quite similar to each other. So in this particular study, they would take the mapping pattern for one language at the five color level and rotate it one hue level at a time all the way through color space until they came back around the other side of the sphere and just tested how many other languages would align with the boundaries that were observed in the first language. And it turns out that the pattern that is observed in languages around the world is very tightly tuned to the observed values that we see in languages around the world. So the rotation of zero degrees is the best alignment to other languages in the world. So this should suggest to us that this idea that divisions formed by language can be completely arbitrary doesn't seem to hold. So we do see some universal constraints. And we're going to take that neo-Warfian perspective that there could be biases that affect our low level perceptual systems. So some of the first studies that were done on the perception of color and color terminology were done by Haider in the 1970s. Now, Elena Haider, we've actually seen her name before as Elena Roche, who worked on prototype theory with the birdiest birds. So in Eleanor Roche's work with the Dani, uh, who speak one of these languages with a very reduced color system, she was interested in investigating how color terminology changed your memory for tokens that you'd seen previously. So she showed some colors in the um, presentation phase of an experiment and then showed people a bunch of different color chips, like little tiles that they could move around on a table and asked them which of the chips they had seen previously. And when they started with desaturated tokens, speakers of Dani and speakers of English uh, made the same errors in their judgments, which was that they incorrectly remembered seeing a much more saturated token than the item that they had seen before. Now, because English and Dani speakers made the same errors, the conclusion in the 1970s was that the language that we use for our color vocabulary makes no difference whatsoever to our perception of colors. However, later on, when Debbie Robertson went to follow up with speakers of the same language, the precise patterns of errors actually had more similarity within language group than across language group. So if they internally generated a name for that color, then their memory is biased by the prototype for the color that has that name. Now, even though uh, our speakers speak different languages, if the prototypes for both languages are the same, then we shouldn't expect to see the differences at the prototypes. Rather, we should expect to see differences at the boundaries.
So Debbie Robertson continued to follow up this idea by testing boundary effects in color categorization. So rather than what is the best exemplar of a color category, she was interested in whether or not the existence of labels might influence how similar you think two colors are. So um, in the Barimbo language, we have one color word, war, and another color word, null, for most English speakers. Over on this side, we have blue. And over here, we have two different kinds of green. They differ in their hue. One is a yellower hue. The other is a kind of more canonically greener hue, but these two are both green. So you can see how the same tokens are categorized differently by speakers of different languages. When people from these two communities are given similarity judgments, it turns out that speakers from the Barinmo background will judge these two colors to be more different from each other than these two colors because they cross a labeling boundary. So even if they have all the time in the world to make the decision, they will genuinely think that these two are more similar to each other. By contrast, English speakers show the exact opposite effect. These two will be deemed to be more different from each other and these two more similar to each other if you speak English because the color category boundary falls in a different spot. By using these boundary effects, Debbie Robertson was also able to extend this into um, the teaching of new category labels and color matching in memory. So what we're starting to see is there are some universal constraints on the prototypicality of colors, but maybe the boundary effects of which colors we label the same and different might be a strong source of variation between people. The other question we might want to ask ourselves is whether this is like a very conscious thing that we do, right? This might be a ruminating strategy. On the other hand, we might want to know whether it's like automatic, something that we can't switch off, something that works so fast that it's a perceptual bias. In a fantastic study by uh, Gilbert, Regier, Kay and Ivory, they managed to test English speaking adults on their ability to detect an odd one out. So in this ring of colors over here, you can see that one of the tokens is a slightly different color than the others, right? And if it's not displaying well on your monitor, it's this one over here. So in this study, people were simply shown a ring of boxes and asked to push a button as quickly as they could when they had established whether the odd one out was on this side of space or this side of space. So they didn't have to name any colors. They didn't have to uh, label the sides as right or left. They just pushed this button if the odd one out was on this side and this button if the odd one out was on this side. So they set up the task in such a way that they had steps of color that were equally visually dissimilar from each other in their measurable properties. So A, B, C, D. And they had already established that for most speakers of English, the boundary fell between token B and token C. So they were then in a position to figure out whether people would have an advantage for identifying differences between B and C over and above differences between C and D. So this is a between category advantage over the within category comparison. Are you more effective at detecting differences for things that have different labels compared to things that have the same label? So what they were able to find was a very interesting pattern of results. Because this was a study that involved reaction times and all of the tokens were presented on a screen, what they actually found was when 
the odd one out was presented in the right visual field, they saw a difference for the within and between color category exemplar speeds. When the token was presented in the left of visual space, they did not see a difference between the reaction times for within and between category exemplars. So what this means is, or what the authors interpreted this finding as showing is that when the odd one out occurred on the side of the visual field that projects to the left hemisphere, so right side of visual space, left hemisphere of the brain, what they observed was that that left hemisphere of the brain was able to bootstrap the labeling information in a way that made the within category exemplar worse and the between category uh, odd one out finding better. So <laughs> the right side of space to the left side of the brain gave people a selective advantage for the with between category odd one out detection task relative to the within category detection task. Importantly, they also conducted a follow up where they asked people to do a verbal interference task at the same time. And in the presence of a verbal interference task, the effect that they had previously observed went away. So the authors conclude that this is very powerful evidence that there is an automatic low level uh, advantage that comes with having labeling that allows us to discriminate between things that are differently labeled when that information is going to our language centers automatically. So we've now seen that this effect seems to occur in the left hemisphere, but um, there's a possibility that if we're relying on reaction times, there are a lot of other processes that could be going on as well. People could be consciously naming the words, people could be thinking about what they're expecting to happen next there may be a way of getting at the even lower level correlates of this effect using a different technique. One technique that has been used for this is actually eye tracking. So in an eye tracking study, Druvoniku teamed up with some of the uh, authors of the previous paper, the Gilbert uh, Regier paper uh, and Anna Franklin knowing that information from the right visual field propagates into the left hemisphere and information from the left visual field propagates into the right hemisphere. They conducted a visual foraging task with just a field of blue with one dot in it that was either from within the same color category or across the labeled color category boundary. Now, in case your monitor is not displaying these colors particularly clearly, I'll just wiggle my mouse over the dot of a different color just here. And the example on the other side is just over here. Now, please bear in mind that when we do these kind of presentations over the internet, some color information might be, might be lost. So it may literally be invisible on your side. Uh, and I should say that in Anna Franklin's lab that I've visited previously, they have expensive computer monitors set up uh, with high, high, high precision color calibration. They need to turn on the monitors before a participant is due to arrive and then measure the colors at different places on the screen and check that they are absolutely precisely accurate. Because this team were using eye trackers, they didn't have to wait until somebody saw a target realized that that was the target that they were looking for and then pushed a button with their finger. Rather, they could simply wait until the person's eyes fell on the correct target and find the period of time just before they moved their eyes. 
to identify when their visual system had detected the presence of the target at the target location. When the target appears in the right visual field, the advantage for detecting a between category exemplar over a within category exemplar is larger than when that target appears in the other side of space. Intriguingly, when they looked at tiny babies who were yet to acquire their color vocabulary, they found a very different pattern. They found that babies were showing a difference between the within category and the between category exemplars only in the left visual field. So this is projecting into the right hemisphere. Now, what's interesting about this finding is that there are some suggestions that when infants are in the word learning stage, they do a lot of their linguistic processing over in the right hemisphere of the brain. And only when that information is like really robustly known, do they start consolidating those linguistic representations over into the left hemisphere language centers. So at this point, we've now seen that languages can name colors very differently from each other, although there do seem to be some universal constraints on what makes a good example of a color. We've also seen some evidence of linguistic determinism in the way that people judge colors as being similar to each other or different from each other, as well as how easily people can pick out an odd colored spot or an odd colored exemplar, depending on whether it is labeled the same or differently to another color. But so far, those very low level perceptual effects, those online effects, those like in real time effects have only been shown in English speakers. Could this be something weird about English speakers? So this is one of my favorite color studies in the series. Uh, and this one takes us into a different language, Russian. And Russian has two words that cover the range of blues that would have just one label in English. So at one end of the spectrum, we have Goluboy. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have Sini. Uh, now this paper is by uh, Boroditsky's team. And Boroditsky we've come across before in the studies on grammatical gender. So in this study, they used a different technique that's called match to sample. And in the match to sample task, you're shown one exemplar of a color, and then you're shown two different possibilities, and you're asked to decide which of the two matches the sample that you've just shown. So this is the sample, and we have two tokens, one of which is a target that is exactly precisely identical, in this case, this one, and another one which is not quite the same. Now they're very, very similar colors. And again, it may not be presenting very clearly on your monitor. So sorry about that. But uh, in this case, the correct answer would be the target over here. And this would be the distractor. So in this study, because we have this beautiful spectrum from Golu boy to Sini, it's possible for each speaker to be tested on where does their particular boundary between Golu boy and Sini fall. And then across that boundary, we can either test a very small difference, like the difference here between seven and nine, or a difference of the same magnitude between say, 16 and 18, which would be a within versus a between category contrast. What's nice about this study is that they've taken some of the best tricks from across the different strands of research. They compare speakers of two different languages. So they have Russian speakers as well as English speakers. 
And they also have a both a verbal interference task, which is uh, reciting a telephone number or something along those lines, and another interference task that makes the task equally difficult, but doesn't invoke language. So in this case, a spatial interference task. And what we're measuring here is what is the category advantage? So how much faster are you when your pair of colors crosses the color category boundary compared to when it's inside the color category boundary? So we can see that there's a huge benefit, a, a bonus above their general reaction time for colors that are close to each other and crossing a category boundary in the no interference and in the spatial interference condition. But in the verbal interference condition, we see something very different. For far colors, the difference is big enough that whether it's within or between doesn't make a difference. And only the Russian speakers are showing us this category advantage effect and they only show it in the no interference and the spatial interference condition. But when verbal interference is applied, uh, things get more difficult and the effect goes away. So where does this leave us? Well, it seems like words that we use to describe colors have subtle but pervasive effects on the way that we can do things with colors, right? So this is outside of just what color do we call what, but what can we do with that information in real time? So we've seen a few different effects here. We've seen that similarity judgments are affected. We've seen that speed of recognition is affected. And we've seen that there can be some memory effects as well for what you saw previously. If we're working with differences between the boundary uh, of two words that are labeled differently or within a category for two words that are labeled the same. There's one last piece of information to share with you. And this is the idea that uh, in the presence of color, when there's nothing else going on, it seems like we activate the linguistic labels for the colors, even if they're not needed. So in this fabulous study, participants were shown some different color patches. When we compare the neurological activity states in the, the bold response uh, during MRI scanning, we can see that in both conditions, visual cortex is highly active. But in terms of the differences between activation for easy to name and hard to name colors, we get localized differences in the activity pattern. Now, people are not asked to say the words aloud. They're not asked to think of these words aloud, but rather in the presence of colors, the representation for the label that we would use for that name is active. So this brings me to what I like to call the hitchhiker effect. Uh, once we have language in our processing system, no matter what we do, no matter how we go about our lives, those representations for the linguistic labels are fizzing along in the left hemisphere, just kind of partially active in case we need them later on. And that activity state may actively engage when we're doing other tasks like recall, when we're doing other tasks like encoding memory for something, like when we're doing other tasks like trying to find something, our memory for what an object looks like may include information about what color it is according to the linguistic label for that color. So these are the kinds of neo-Warfian effects that we can attentively look into in our future hypothesis formations.